Let's travel, folks, shall we? Americans are traveling outside the country more than ever before. This year, over 50 million independent trips so far. But few of us Americans seem to be fully content with the experience. Students travel for study abroad. How many of you have done that? And nearly every weekend, you roam to new destinations. This is travel with a lot of exploration, but maybe not quite enough discovery. Relative grown-ups travel for business and can be so occupied with it that one conference room comes to look like another. That's travel with low discovery and low exploration. A couple of years ago, I flew home from Barcelona with a copy of Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. I was preparing for a class on the flight, and so I was traveling with Tocqueville, as it were. This French nobleman, who visited the United States for nine months in the 1830s, published two volumes that have now been in print for nearly 200 years. The person next to me on the plane turned out to be French, so as we chatted about Tocqueville, I found myself thinking, you know, this is a guy who could teach all of us, not just about ourselves as Americans, but about how to travel well. Because Tocqueville's journey was so momentous, we're still reading about it all these years later and discovering aspects of Americanness that we can be comfortable with or not so comfortable with. But let's talk a little bit about Tocqueville as a guide to productive travel. You might ask, what does this guy have to offer this guy? And here's what I think. Alexis de Tocqueville and his best friend, Gustave de Beaumont, planned their trip incredibly carefully. They read for many months before they came to the United States about the newly emerging United States, its tensions, its discoveries, its victories. They talked about it together. They talked about it with their circle of friends. They were noblemen, so they had time to do things like this. But they took their trip incredibly seriously, and even during the six-week voyage to the United States, they spent a lot of time talking to the passengers. Many of these were Americans returning to their country, and they asked them all sorts of questions. They had voracious curiosity about the place and the people who occupied it. So by the time they got to the United States, they were traveling with a lot of knowledge and wisdom, and they had a lot of basis from which to understand what they saw. They also, as we'll discuss later, really, really actively compared all the time. So this issue of planning but leaving some room is sort of like when you order coffee and you say, with room. Plan, but leave things open for some kind of inspiration and serendipity that might come along in your trip. Say, for example, you're in Brussels. This is a non-random example. It happened to me. You're with a friend. You try some chocolate, mmm, very good, in Belgium, and you decide to throw away your plans for that day and go to every chocolatier. <laughs> Not just to sample the chocolate, though one must when in Belgium, but to talk to the people who make the chocolate, because they're there in the chocolate shops. And so it's true at the end of the day, you have toxic shock syndrome from sugar, but you have not only sampled amazing chocolate you'll remember all your life, You've befriended the proprietors of chocolate in a way that many travelers don't, and it's one of the most memorable things about Belgium in one's time there. You've all seen the 36 hours model that's propagated by certain publications that shall remain nameless in this talk, 36 hours in, and then usually the name of a great city. Those are not bad in principle when you're discovering a place using this sort of loose planning model, because they can give you some highlights of places to see that you might not find otherwise. I've had really interesting drinks in really bizarre places in foreign cities because I was alerted by the 36 hours thing. But most of the 36 hour scheduling really should be 48 hours. You don't want to run from thing to thing as sort of a mindless traveler just looking for experience, 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 but no time to digest. So that model's pretty good, especially if you stretch it out. But all of this should simply be abandoned if you're in a great place and you see a central meeting place, whether it's a cafe or it's a square in a village, where people are just sitting, having a beverage, and doing different activities. That's when you should drop everything, sit down, and watch what's going on around you. If you watch incredibly carefully, you might even learn how to be an effective customer in a French cafe, which is really a high bar for American travelers. So 
Plan, leave some room, and let your schedule breathe when opportunity comes along. This is sort of the Tocquevillian recipe. They knew that they were going to go to New York, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C. All intelligent choices for people coming to America for the first time. But they ended up going many places they hadn't planned on based on, the, based on the conversations they had. And they knew this. They left time. So their trip became flexible. They learned amazing things about the United States. Their ostensible purpose of their trip was actually to study American prisons. So they went to prisons everywhere they went. But they didn't limit their conversations to those available there. And um, rather than calling them Alexis de Tocqueville and Gustave de Beaumont, let's just call them Alex and Gus. Alex and Gus actually produced incredible amounts of written work from their trip because they were busy writing letters home all the time. So they planned, they had their paper with them, they knew what they were doing. And I simply have to mention, because I'm American and I'm talking to a primarily American audience, packing with room is also a really good idea. <laughs> so I traveled a lot in my life as somebody who works in international education, and my mantra is, you can only take seven pieces of clothing, no matter how long the trip is. And if you go for less than a week, it should be less than seven. How do you do this? The women in particular are looking pained. <laughs> Use basic colors. Use your accessories to dress it up. Not florals, which do not travel well. Leave your primary colors at home. You will stand out everywhere in the world. Wear basic colors, use accessories, and travel light. Light of heart, less back pain, no legs screaming at you. And you'll notice when you travel that other people who are not American are traveling incredibly light. Follow their example. Here Tocqueville, by the way, is not a role model. The guy traveled with a steamer trunk. <laughs> but he traveled in an age when you had people who carried your luggage for you. If that's your income bracket, bless you and your steamer trunk. <laughs> So what else can we learn from Tocqueville and his travels? He focused on people, not places. He did not run throughout Washington, D.C. to visit every landmark and then check it off on a mental checklist and go back to France. Everywhere he went, rather than being a landscape, was a peoplescape. So he talked to people from all trades and all walks of life. And he had a very overt idea in his mind of what he thought America was, a land of equality. And he was astonished, nevertheless, by the kinds of things he saw when he was here. He saw in 1831 and 1832 that women would walk, single women would walk with a single man in the street without being engaged. Horrors. But he saw that this sort of freedom was applicable in certain ways to directions he thought France should go, and maybe not so much in other ways. But then he would ask people questions about this freedom that he found so unusual. Social freedom, relative gender freedom, though he also talked a lot about once women marry, they became <coughs> deeply oppressed. Oh, that rebel. So, so his focus on people doesn't mean he didn't go to signature places. He went to signature places, and then he asked people about them. What the various landmarks in DC and Philadelphia in particular meant to the people who lived there. So following this example of not gobbling up landmarks, but using a peoplescape as your logic, think about the times that have been most memorable in your own travels, domestic or foreign. I lived in the Soviet Union for a year. I saw everything one could see. I spent a lot of time in Red Square. It's not the landmarks I remember. It's the people with whom I spoke. But the ones that are most memorable are people with whom I spoke in landmark locations. So Novodevichy Cemetery, one of the most beautiful and haunting places in the entire world. I walked through Novodevichy on a very leisurely autumn day, much like today, with leaves drifting across the path with an esteemed Soviet historian who talked to me about all the gravestones we were passing. He sang little snatches of song based on composers. He recited poetry. He cursed every single political leader grave that we passed. We stopped at Khrushchev, the fascinating Soviet leader, whose monument was crafted by a sculptor whom he had cursed during his life, to whom he later wrote a note of apology and said, will you please design my gravestone? 
Khrushchev's gravestone, half white, half black. The ultimate mixed leader for the Soviet Union. And I remember that day incredibly clearly. I remember what my friends said. I remember what we did. And after that incredibly sort of nostalgic walk through the cemetery, we went and in outstanding Russian style drank vodka and reminisced. Very memorable. Cairo, on a back terrace with one of my dairy, very dear friends. Beautiful day, palm trees, sunshine, talking about fear, talking about changes in government in Egypt, talking about the very personal ways in which this affects her life every day and her fears for her family. Incredibly memorable and part of my personal people's gape in beautiful landscapes. One of my favorite authors who's written about places I know and love wrote a book on Paris that is absolutely priceless. And in his descriptions of life in Paris, he describes everything. He and his wife were there to live and fully engage. She was pregnant. She had her baby in Paris. And one of the most memorable details he shares in his book is not the food he ate, though we'll get to that in a little bit. One of the most memorable details is he talks about the gynecologist she interacted with as she went through her, her pregnancy and how cool they were. Like he found himself thinking, boy, the gynecologists in this society are like kind of the cool guys of the medical profession. They wear all black and they look really great, but I never forget what they do. So all of these things, <laughs> all of these things really enrich your perspective if you're focusing on people. And a final Tocquevillian moment is dare to compare. We Americans sometimes are afraid to generalize about other peoples because we might say something that's not particularly PC. That fear can be countered by the way that Tocqueville talked about us as Americans. He didn't make sweeping generalizations, the Americans, blah, 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 and they are trapped by this. He very carefully observed, wrote about it, and then backed up everything he said with fascinating examples and details. Those details remain instructive. Tocqueville was sometimes wrong about things, in some cases very wrong, but he was always interesting. And when he was right, wow, we still look at his books and discover things about ourselves. So how does this apply to us? Well, daring to compare means if you go into a restaurant somewhere in the world and you order a cold drink and it comes to you without ice in it, repress your outrage. Most people in the world, when they're served something they don't expect, perhaps short of sheep's eyeball, realize they're having a cultural moment, that this is how this thing is served in this country, so maybe I should try it this way. Americans have become infamous in the world for going places and being served drinks without ice in particular and becoming very shrill, like how could the waiter forget the ice? This is a drink, it's supposed to have ice in it. And now what happens in many countries is they ascertain that you're American, they bring the drink, and they bring a little glass with ice in it and a spoon. And how many times have I heard Americans who haven't traveled before say, oh, isn't that cute how the English do their ice? It's like, uh, no, they're actually just doing that for you. Do you see anyone else in the cafe with this issue? So, you know, <laughs> you might actually survive drinking beverages that are not ice cold for a period of time in your life and impress those around you by not defaulting to the nearest American shrill scream. And I think other peoples who are not Americans are very quick to see this as cultural difference, not an insult. Tocqueville, when he was in the United States, did write critically about various things. The United States was what he considered a very primitive place in terms of especially roads and food. So he wrote in his personal letters home once at length about the condition of the roads. And he wrote home again at length about the execrable food that he had eaten and then he pulled up his pantaloons and he moved on. We can do the same. So I like to think that the many thousands of Americans who have now spent extended time in Europe are one of the reasons why the United States has a slow food and quality fresh food movement that is really profound and affecting our culture. If you were to bring Tocqueville or in fact any French person to the country, and say, what do you think of this revolutionary new American idea about eating meals slowly and using fresh food and taking time to prepare great food, they would say, wow, we've been doing this for centuries. I'm so glad that you're finally tuned in. So I think there's some really nice learning and reciprocity across cultures that Tocqueville would celebrate. 
Really, in daring to compare, there's no incident that happens to you abroad that is too lowly to put in your personal repertoire of learning. Not long after the breakup of the Soviet Union, I was in Russia visiting a grandmotherly type who I saw every time I went back, and her apartment building had been privatized, and so there were many changes in it, but one of them was that there was a nail salon in the basement. And this was such an unusual thing, I thought I would go fingers first to experiment change in the new Russia. So I went down there. I was greeted by Natasha, <laughs> who said she would give me a manicure, which is in Russian, you'll be astonished to know, manicure. And so I sat down, and it was all looking very kind of not very posh. But then she turned on a hot pot, and I thought, Natasha is going to make me a cup of coffee. This is progress in Russia. So I had my nails there, she was kind of working away. The hot pot starts to boil, and she says, you will now place your hands in the boiling water. <laughs> and I say, I don't think I can do that. And she gets that Slavic snarl, which really, really was a carryover from Soviet times, and says, how else can I work on your cuticle? So. Perhaps that small incident told me that Russia still had a ways to go. <laughs> so Tocqueville had a way of bringing people together and facilitating interesting conversations, both in his day and now, after nearly a 200-year period. What can we learn from this man about exploration? Something very simple. Meet people. Talk to them. Take them by the hand. Walk the paths they walk. Write about it nearly every day and share what you write. <coughs> Thanks. <laughs>